Hello, everybody, as you gradually join us. Thanks for um, visiting, and we will give everyone about a minute to join us, and then we will jump right in and talk about some nanobubbles. All right, it looks like we have a good number of visitors here, so let's get started. Welcome to the monthly public aquaponics webinar. I am Brian Filipowicz, Chairman and CEO of the Aquaponics Association, and I'm joined with Mr. Warren Russell from Moliere Inc., who I will introduce a little more fully in a bit. Today's webinar is Proven Results, Nanobubbles Improve Aquaculture and Horticulture. This is an exciting one. Before we jump into the web webinar, I'm gonna do a quick 30 second plug for our annual conference, which is coming up October 22nd through 24th. It's all virtual. We have uh, three days, over 60 sessions lined up. We have virtual tours, breakout discussions where you, the guests get to jump into the conversation, uh, panel discussions. It's going to be a lot of fun. All of the sessions will be recorded and any ticket holders will be able to watch them all afterwards. Um, so it should be a good time and very valuable. Tickets are $50 off through the end of September. So if you're interested, please head to aquaponicsconference.org. Um, for today's webinar, very straightforward. We're doing a minute or two introduction right here. Then we're gonna play about a 20 minute pre-recorded session from Warren, just so that we avoid any internet or technical issues. Um, and then we, we will come right back into a discussion and a Q and A. Um, as we go along, you can be typing your questions or chatting in the chat or the Q and A area below. Um, so please don't be afraid to ask questions. And now I am going to introduce Warren. Warren is an experienced entrepreneur with over 15 years of business management experience in wastewater treatment and environmental services in Southern Africa and the Middle East. Prior to being at Moliere, um, Warren founded ErgoFit USA, which focused on, focuses, focused on environmental consulting and designing wastewater treatment processes for municipal industrial oil and gas applications. And currently, Warren sir, uh, is the co-founder and serves as the Chief Commercial Officer of Moliere, Inc. Um, Warren, do you want to say anything before we jump into your video? No, just good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining, and I uh, hope this is informative. And then we'll look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Great. Now, I am going to try the inimitable screen, video screen share. Fingers crossed. Okay. And then Warren, if you if me, you and I will just mute our mics while we play the presentation. You got it. Hi, my name is Warren Russell and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Moliere. And thank you for including us in this conference today. I'm gonna to be talking to you about oxygen and nanobubbles and how they can be utilized within aquaponics to improve the performance and stability of each component and process. Essentially, when we look at a typical aquaponics system, you have a six-step process divided into three main groups, the production of fish, cultivation of plants through hydroponics, and a biological treatment system designed to convert waste into nutrients for plant growth. In each module, oxygen plays a critical role, and without enough of it, health, growth, and consistency is compromised. The impact of the oxygen nanobubbles can be divided into four categories. Firstly, oxygen nanobubbles improve water quality by increasing dissolved oxygen, reducing algae and pathogen levels. Plant health is promoted by improved root development and disease suppression. Fish health and growth is improved by maintaining ideal dissolved oxygen levels that facilitate better feed conversion ratios. And lastly, within biological filtration, nitrification is enhanced by increasing microbial biomass and activity. Let's begin with looking at plant health within different types of hydroponic crop production. No matter what the method is, water quality is an often overlooked and undervalued input that can substantially influence the productivity of a system. I'm not simply talking about EC and pH, I'm referring to parameters like dissolved oxygen and oxidation reduction potential. 
In many instances, especially in summer, high water temperatures are a major challenge to consistent healthy crop production. And along with warm water comes lower dissolved oxygen, more plant stress and more root disease pressure. Deep water culture ponds are particularly susceptible and unfortunately diffusers and blowers are simply not effective enough. What we've been able to demonstrate in over 100 horticulture installations, ranging from deep water culture to NFT and drip, is that oxygen nanobubbles are a simple and cost effective way to optimize the quality of water that, that mitigate environmental risk factors and promote optimal growing conditions. These benefits can be summarized into four distinct but interconnected groups. First and foremost, we inject oxygen nanobubbles and supersaturate dissolved oxygen in the water, which delivers and sustains high levels of oxygen in the root zone. As a result, new root development is promoted, nutrients absorbed more efficiently, and plants metabolism boosted. Biofilm within the hydroponic system is scoured and prevented from reattachment by the nanobubbles. And outside of the greenhouse, we reduce the presence of pathogens and algae that form in source water reservoirs by lysing algae cells and elevating the oxidation reduction potential of the water. When you think about where nanobubbles add value within a traditional hydroponic or irrigation process, we focus on three primary areas. Source water treatment, which could be irrigation water sources like canals, ponds, or reservoirs. Saturation of clean irrigation water prior to entering a drip system or oxygenation of a deep water culture pond. And lastly, treatment of dirty drain water to either promote a biological or chemical oxidation process. In source water applications, we concentrate on increasing the oxidation reduction potential, eliminating algae, reducing turbidity, TOC, and pathogen levels. In doing so, and by treating and cleaning the water prior to it entering a facility, we improve both filtration and sanitation processes. When oxygenating water systems like deep water culture ponds, the focus is on maximizing both dissolved oxygen and nanobubble concentrations to ensure high levels reach the plant roots to create optimal conditions in the root zone. How much oxygen is optimal? Well, that depends on a variety of factors like water temperature, crop type, disease pressures, solar radiation, and time of year. In an uncoupled system, where efficient plants are adequately separated, the range can be anywhere between 10 and 30 parts per million for plants. However, in a coupled system, we have to be careful not to over oxygenate the fish, and therefore we typically manage dissolved oxygen levels at saturation or right below it. So when we're talking about nanobubbles, it's important to understand what exactly makes them unique compared to all other bubbles and other methods of aeration or oxygenation. To start, as the name implies, nanobubbles are incredibly small generally ranging between 100 to 120 nanometers in size, which is around 2,500 times smaller than a grain of salt. Their behavior in liquids is much more similar to that of colloidal particles rather than bubbles. And here's a video of some nanobubbles refracting the laser beam of a nanocyte under the microscope. They have little to no buoyancy and follow the random movement of Brownian motion in bulk solution. In mass, they have an extremely large surface area and stability in solution that makes nanobubbles a perfect vector for dissolving gas into liquids. By comparison, micro and macro bubbles produced by traditional aeration systems will only dissolve on average between 1 to 3% of oxygen per vertical foot of water. And when you consider the limited depth of most water storage tanks or cultivation systems, it's easy to understand why traditional methods of injecting oxygen into water are not cost effective. By comparison, using a nanobubble technology like Moliere's, we're able to transfer between 85 to 95% of all the oxygen injected into water. That metric dramatically shifts the economics of using oxygen as a low cost non-chemical tool to treat hydroponic water and to promote plant health. Nanobubbles also have a number of secondary benefits that add value beyond the gas they carry. For example, because of their ionically charged surface and high internal pressure, when they collapse, they will generate their own types of oxidants with similar effects to hydrogen peroxide and ozone. These oxidants will lyse algae cells or inactivate pathogens like pythium, phytophthora, and others. Nanobubbles are also highly effective at scouring the surfaces of water pipes to remove mineral and biofilm deposits, adding a simple non-chemical tool to help improve the hygiene and microbial balance of a cultivation system. They also have another important impact on the properties of water, specifically, Nanobubbles reduce the surface tension, which in turn allows water to move through small, smaller capillaries with less resistance and delivers a more uniform distribution of water 
in the substrate and root zone. The surface of the nanobubbles are also electrochemically charged, and consequently, they increase the electric charge of water, which increases the dispersion and homogeneous concentration of ions in fluids. In summary, when you're thinking about nanobubbles, you're thinking about two things, highly efficient oxygen transfer into water, making oxygen very affordable to achieve specific and targeted saturation levels, and the unique properties of these bubbles that remain suspended in solution until they dissolve that will provide oxidation benefits, reduce water surface tension, and scouring effects to clean surfaces. At a high level, we will produce our nanobubbles through an elegant hydrodynamic diffusion process, which most importantly is scalable and reliable. We start with 25 gallons per minute and go all the way up to 1500 gallons per minute. As water flows through our nanobubble generator, we inject different gases, in this case oxygen, into the flowing water to achieve supersaturated levels of dissolved oxygen with high concentrations of nanobubbles. We frequently measure several hundred million nanobubbles per milliliter of water, which is an astonishing number when you think about that in terms of additional surface area and charge potential they're adding to water. It's important to note that this process is not pressurized, and as a result, the production of nanobubbles is not an energy intensive process. When it comes to aeration or oxygenation of water, there are certainly many familiar alternatives one can use, each one, however, having their own pros and cons. The specific constraint within hydroponics or aquaponics in general is that we're dealing with shallow water environments that are difficult to oxygenate efficiently and economically. This, however, is typically not a limitation for nanobubble oxygenation, as the majority of the gas is transferred within the nanobubble generator and not as a typical micro or macro bubble dissolving oxygen as it rises through the water column. As it relates to the role of oxygen and plant health, both research and our experience has identified five spheres of influence. Most importantly, oxygen promotes healthy root growth. This includes capillary root development and maintaining a beneficial microbial community in the root zone. A larger active root surface area enables more nutrient uptake capacity. Oxygen also plays an important role in vital plant metabolic processes like ATP and enzyme production. And by promoting each one of these functions, flowers, fruit and vegetables are able to grow to their full potential with less impact from environmental stress. So with that being said, let me touch on some of the case studies that demonstrate some of these benefits I've just described. Revel Greens in Minnesota is a longtime customer of ours and is a well-known leafy green grower under glass where we've provided two distinct benefits to their growing. The first is we've helped reduce and maintain low levels of pythium in their ponds year round. Pythium, as many of you know, is an ever present pathogen that targets roots weakening and sometimes killing the plant. What we've demonstrated is that high levels of dissolved oxygen and anabols can be an effective pythium management tool. More importantly, in this case and many others like it, the elevated dissolved oxygen was able to promote plant growth and increase yields by an average of 15%. Switching over to NFT, here we have Rebel Farm in Colorado, who is a smaller grower supplying the restaurant industry in Denver with culinary greens. High altitude, low DO in the water and long gutters was giving them poor crop uniformity, slower plant growth and poor yields. Improving the water quality and boosting the DO levels with oxygen nanobubbles delivered a 22% higher yield in a shorter growing cycle with less root disease pressure. This is an example of a project we did with a research partner in the Netherlands called Delphi. They were studying the effects of adding oxygen nanobubbles to irrigation water for hydroponic strawberries grown in a controlled environment. And again, what the research validated is that high levels of dissolved oxygen and nanobubbles were able to increase yields by 14% and lower instances of disease. Closer to home, here in California, we have another example of yield improvement with hydroponically grown strawberries using oxygen nanobubble enriched irrigation water. At this location, source water quality was an issue and registered little to no dissolved oxygen. Since the water was stored in tanks prior to fertigation, we were easily able to treat and inject oxygen nanobubbles to substantially increase the DO levels and deliver at least 20 ppm to the roots. This boost in DO delivered a 15% yield improvement. In this particular study, 
We worked with another research partner called Nova Crop Control in the Netherlands to look at the impact of high levels of oxygen nanobubbles in tomato production. And once again, as with the other case studies, we're focused on three distinct areas, improving water quality, root health, and pathogen control, and how by using elevated levels of oxygen and oxygen nanobubbles to improve these areas, we improve fruit and crop development. In this case, achieving an eight to 10% high yield over and above the control group. In the case of organic farming, here we have a large grower in Guatemala that was looking to use oxygen nanobubbles to promote better nitrification of the organic nutrients in the drain water. In this case, the additional dissolved oxygen was able to double the available nitrate levels by promoting the nitrifying bacteria. From a health and yield perspective, they observed a much higher productivity right through the end of the season. As I mentioned to you earlier in the presentation, Source water treatment with nanobubbles can transform the quality of water entering a greenhouse and reduce chemical treatments. Here we have some photos of a recent project we started in Spain, treating roughly 8 million gallons of catchment water with air nanobubbles. I think the photos speak for themselves, but a remarkable transformation in water clarity. These improvements provided numerous benefits, ranging from less frequent filter cleaning and backflushing to a reduction in chemical treatments and cleaning of the irrigation system. Switching over to the aquaculture side of aquaponics, Molière has spent a lot of time over the last couple of years developing our domain expertise in aquaculture by applying our technology in a wide variety of applications. We worked with everything from shrimp to salmon and have systems throughout the Americas and the salmon producing epicenters like Chile and Norway. In the vast majority of these projects and applications, the goal of our technology is to lower the cost of oxygenation while maintaining optimal growing conditions. Secondary objectives include things like off flavor compound removal, better water quality and disease reduction through enhanced water treatment, and in some cases, improving dissolved nitrogen removal. To highlight some of these performance benefits of our nanobubbles, I've included a few of our case studies for your review. This is a project we did with one of Surmax salmon ras hatcheries in Canada, who is looking to improve the oxygen transfer efficiency of the existing low head oxygenators. While LHOs can be an effective low cost oxygenator, in this case, they were not able to meet the oxygen demand of the biomass in their system. As a result, DO levels were low and the feed conversion ratios were suboptimal. One of our high flow nanobubble generators was retrofitted into their system and the oxygen was diverted from the diffusers in the LHO and injected through our system. The results are the perfect embodiment of the potential of this technology. Essentially by increasing dissolved oxygen levels by 15%, and using 17% less oxygen, they were able to achieve a 22% increase in biomass growth over a 30 day period. Using resources more efficiently and increasing productivity is the principal objective of our technology. In this Hendrix genetics case study in Chile, this site had a particular issue with too much dissolved nitrogen in their fresh water supply and non effective solution to remove it. Degasses was not an easy or cost effective option. Using one of our 200 GPM systems, oxygen nanobubbles were injected directly into the freshwater canal to simultaneously increase dissolved oxygen levels by 41% and decrease the dissolved nitrogen by 9%, bringing it below the target of 98% and an effective demonstration of gas displacement. In this example, we have a US Fish and Wildlife flow through hatchery also battling optimal dissolved oxygen levels throughout their raceways. As with so many facilities like this one, poor oxygen transfer efficiency of their existing oxygenation system was a major limitation to increasing dissolved oxygen levels and productivity of the hatchery. By redirecting the oxygen injection through our nanobubble generator, they were able to increase the oxygenation capacity by 35%. Off flavors and the compounds that cause them continue to be a major focal point for RAS production regardless of the type of fish grown. Purging with fresh water prior to harvest is currently the most effective tool to address this, but in many cases, the purging duration can make the difference between profit and loss. Being able to potentially manage these compounds throughout the production process with nanobubbles has been a key area of interest for Molière. Through university research, they were able to validate that air nanobubbles can significantly reduce MIB and jasmine concentrations in water. This research validates that nanobubbles can have significant financial importance well beyond the role of oxygenation. Lastly, 
I'm going to talk to you about biofiltration, the critical conversion of waste into plant usable nutrients. As many of you know, the byproduct of fish production is ammonia. While nitrogen is an essential macronutrient for plant growth, the ammonia must first be converted into nitrate through biological nitrification for the plant to be able to use it. In an aquaponics process, this is typically facilitated through a biofilter of some kind. First, nitrosomonas bacteria convert the ammonia to nitrite, and the nitrobacteria metabolize the nitrites to produce usable nitrates. These groups of nitrifying bacteria require adequate oxygen to perform this process efficiently. That specific oxygen demand is around 4.6 milligrams of oxygen to one part or one milligram of ammonia. Through molecular and DNA analysis, we were able to track the biokinetic yield efficiencies of a nitrification process using different forms of aeration. And what we observed is that nanobubble aeration produced 22% more cell mass and removed 15% more ammonia when compared to diffused aeration. The key takeaway is that nanobubbles can significantly improve the performance of a biological filtration process. This can be realized by a dedicated nanobubble system supporting equipment like an MVVR, or it can simply be a byproduct of an oxygenating nanobubble device up or downstream of the biofilter. And that concludes my presentation. I hope you've all enjoyed it and thank you for participating. I know we have a planned Q&A following this presentation, but if, if any of you think of any additional questions, please feel free to email us and we'll be happy to assist. Thank you. Great, thank you. So, um, Warren, before we go into the questions, um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Okay. No, I, I see there's a, a few questions already, so I'm happy to just kick off that. Yeah, so Amanda asks, are the impacts of this technology on feed conversion ratio and other parameters statistically significant compared to other aerators? Statistically, for sure, but I think it's, it's important to distinguish that you know, as it relates to how we contextualize the, the role of our technology in feed conversion ratios, for us, it's, it's a lot more about resource management. So there's, I think it's, it's well understood there's a direct correlation to oxygen saturation rates or dissolved oxygen levels and what those feed conversion ratios will be. So we look at it not so much as nanobubbles magically, you know, altering that feed, feed conversion ratio as it relates to dissolved oxygen, but rather being able to use that oxygen more efficiently to achieve and sustain an optimal dissolved oxygen level, which then as a result translates into a, a more, uh, more or, or, or better uh, feed conversion ratio. And that was specifically the example that we had there with, um, with CIRMAC in Canada. Um, again, I, I wouldn't say so much of it, it's, it's magically some sort of transformation from the nanobubbles, but rather just being able to sustain a higher dissolved oxygen level proportionate to the biomass in the system allowed them to achieve that uh, better feed conversion ratio. Great. Um, Cam asked, how long has this top technology been around and utilized? Um, how long has Molier focused on this? And are there other companies exploring this type of oxygen distribution? Yeah, so, so nanobubbles is, is not new by, by any means. Um, it's been around for a number of years, decades, I should say. Um, a lot of the early research and development was, was out of Asia, specifically Japan. Um, it's been used within aquaculture and horticulture for, again, probably a few decades. Obviously, a little bit newer to the Americas and specifically North America. Um, I think as we entered this market, we, we were certainly one of the first early adopters to do this at true commercial scale. Um, for us, we're several years in now on both, on both horticulture and aquaculture. Um, a little bit longer runway on, on the horticulture applications but but yeah i mean there's there's new companies entering the market all the time there's uh at least four to five dominant dominant ways that you can produce nanobubbles in different forms um unfortunately you know success brings in a lot of competition and you know the only caveat that i would say to that is that um unfortunately you get a lot of piggy pack um sort of technologies where there's sort of perhaps an erroneous or a misleading claim about nanobubble production when it may not necessarily be um, 
you know, that effective or, or a, um, a good quality product or process. Great. Next question from Alan Patillo, a, uh, a former webinar presenter, a longtime mm -hmm. friend of the association. Uh, what would the impact on water quality within a bioflock aquaculture system be? Uh, yes. And also, could this technology be used in saltwater systems for shrimp production without negative impacts? Yeah, we 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 um, we have systems in shrimp farms, um, both salt RAS water. and in saltwater. Yes, and um, the, the 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 distinction with the bioflock, I mean, it, it very much is analogous to um, you know sort of the wastewater treatment. It's it's really where bioflock suffers is where you don't get good, either good mixing or good oxygen availability. And that's where you may get sort of filamentous growth or, or other kinds of bacteria. So we definitely, one of the byproducts of using this and certainly uh, feedback that we've been given from uh, specifically a, a shrimp grower is, is that you do get a transformation in the bioflock health. And sort of if you're looking like at the, the settleability of it, and it's certainly the color you get a much more active um, aerobic biomass. And, and specifically what we're looking at is, is how the oxygen and, and through homogeneous mixing in the water, but also through the nanobubbles, you're delivering that oxygen a little bit deeper into the flock. And so that proportion of or percentage of aerobic to, to perhaps um, anaerobic or at least dead cell mass in that bioflock is, is much healthier when you get a, that better distribution of oxygen within it. Gustavo asked, is there a direct relationship between oxygen supersaturation and growth improvement? I think not so. If the question is supersaturation, I think there's, there's basically a, a, a point of diminishing returns. So we look at essentially that sweet spot with, as it relates to fish production. Um, we, we look at, balancing between what's economical to sustain for the system and what's that optimal point. So typically for fish, I mean, that, that, that ratio could be anywhere between 100 and 120% at the upper end of the threshold. And that will be proportionate to the other partial pressure gas pressures like um, CO2 and nitrogen in the water. So you, you do have to balance the system, but, but generally most people aren't exceeding it. Um, hundred percent saturation and, and generally, you know, that's, that's the sweet spot from an economical standpoint and optimal rearing condition. Um, Prajul, apologies for my pronunciation of that, asked, why not supersaturate the water in the aquaculture side? For that reason of um, exceeding the, the, the total gas pressures of, of the contributing gases. So, um, you never want to you never want to over act over oxygenate to potentially cause gas bubble disease, which is actually a lot of times it's erroneous erroneously associated with the the oxygen or over oxygenating, but it has more to do with um, the combination of the gases. So that that example that I was showing you there with that we did in Chile, um, there was a desire to increase the dissolved oxygen level within the system, but they had they also issue with um, the high dissolved nitrogen in that water. And as a result, um, exceeding saturation in when you look at the, the total gas pressure or pressures um, was above 100%. And that's obviously potentially uh, fatal to the fish. So again, it's, it's something that you have to take in, uh, as in account from site specific and make sure that you're aware of what the dissolved concentrations of those different gases to see what your ceiling is uh, for the amount of oxygen. Great, um, Alan Patillo, uh, again, he asked, could you speak more directly about how this technology saves money and how big a farm has to be to make this um, techno technology financially feasible? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we get that question a lot, um, obviously, even within aquaponics, you get a full spectrum from, you know, small hobbyists all the way up to commercial. I think probably the smallest commercial system that we have is about a thousand square feet of, of um, lettuce production. Um, that particular farmer uh, sells his produce to, to the farmer's market. 
I would tell you that his payback on the equipment at that time was less than 18 months um, based on an improvement in not only yield, but, but um, crop cycles per year or per season. Um, that was seasonal because they're in Denver um, or just outside of Denver, I should say. And uh, um, winter was, was obviously a, a period where it was a little more challenging to grow. Um, but yeah, so we, we have that still spectrum. The economics really comes about resource management. So um, we have on the far end of the spectrum, you have some customers that are growing in very warm conditions. And as a result, they need to use coolers or chillers on the water to prevent disease pressures. We have some customers that either offset that requirement, so not, not cooling it, cooling the water to the same degree, or we have some extreme cases where they've removed or eliminated the need for chillers as well. So again, you know, if you look at the general configuration of, of most hydroponic or aquaponic systems, the biggest challenges that we see are that it's difficult to auctionate um, those water sources, whether it's particularly like deep water culture tanks. Um, we have some customers that you know, the, the, the ponds are 100 meters long um, and, and a little bit more than, than uh, a foot deep. Uh, it's very difficult to auctionate that evenly um, unless you have a, a, a technology similar to ours and a process that you can do it and recirculate and distribute it that way. So um, it's about what is the cost input cost take to sustain an ideal condition that gives you best plant growth or best fish growth? And then what is it, you know, how does that translate to feed conversion ratios and, you know, essentially feeds a big expense in, in, in fish production. So maximizing that, and when you take all those contributing factors, you will see that using those resources more efficiently does pay for itself. It's not just about reducing the cost of oxygen. It's about all those contributing factors and feed conversion ratio and, and uh, water quality or potentially improving um, the temperature threshold of, of that uh, crop. Have you seen any issues using nanobubble technologies in hard water? In hard water, no. But, you know, in a, as it relates specifically to our technology, um, we're, the system is best when operated continuously, where you're turning the system on and off, on and off you know, multiple times your day or prolonged periods of time. That does create opportunities for mineral deposits as well as, as biological deposits. So the only variation would, would be there in terms of the maintenance schedule that may be required to, to clean the equipment. So hardness, um, you know, we have a number of systems in Mexico, for example, where the water quality is, is hard and there's a lot of bacteria. And um, instead of a system never being looked at for, for six months or 12 months, they may be doing some preventative maintenance once a month. And that would be the distinguishing difference there. Great. Let's see what else we have here. What size of solid particles um, can it handle? Um, generally, we say up to about 10 mils. Um, does your system also have small pores which get blocked by impurities? No, just to my same point before, um, the process is hydrodynamic. So um, generally, it's self-cleaning. Um, with the exception of just the same, the same context of, of maintaining a, a pump or a typical irrigation system, um, the, 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 the more times that you're, you're making that static environment with water, with biology in it, um, reducing that, that, that um, surface friction um, is an opportunity for fouling. So we would, we would sort of be in a similar context to, to how you would manage a, a pump system in the environment. Um, is atmospheric air used for the source of oxygen or does it require compressed oxygen? Yeah, so it, we, we can, our technology can use any gas source. In some cases, we're using CO2 for pH adjustment. Um, in most cases, hydroponically, right? So 
just going back to the fundamentals of, of um, gas saturation, uh, follows Henry's law, so proportionate to temperature and pressure, it, it basically dictates the amount of, of dissolved oxygen or dissolved gas that you put into the solution. Um, in, in relation to what we determine um, as an ideal growing environment for plants or fish, generally as a, for, for plants, it, there is some specificity based on the crop type, but we're, we're, we in probably 90% of the applications are growing plants and super saturation levels. So that's above the normal saturation point or that equilibrium point. And the way, the only way that you can do that is one, in, in, increase the, the percentage of, of oxygen in the gas. So in this case is using a high purity oxygen uh, or two, putting that water under pressure. So we don't pressurize the water. So the only way to achieve super saturation is with um, a high purity of gas. Um, and so 90% of our um, applications, it's either using um, pure oxygen or an oxygen concentrator that's on site or either part of our equipment. Do these high saturation levels create corrosion issues in the infrastructure? No. Let's see here. Um, how much do these units typically cost? So someone says here they have an 800 gallon system with a DWC bed um, and a media bed. So like for, for that person with an 800 gallon um, media bed and DWC system, like what size would they need and what does that cost? Yeah, I would, I would, I would probably say that's a little bit too small for for us um although it could be it certainly could be used in, in a batch process so um you know there are some customers that are doing um let's just say it's it's drip irrigation and they may be we, we may be auctionating that fertigation solution prior to going out so you, you may only be treating 275 gallons at a time but the equipment is operated on a as a batch process. So it turns on, it recirculates, oxygenates that water, and then it, then once it's reached a, a set point, it's, it goes through the drip system. For an 800 gallon system in deep water culture, honestly, it would be probably not commercially viable um, in that example, because when the system would have to operate for only probably, you know, maximum 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day um, to achieve that saturation point. But generally, as for our equipment, we have just as from a cost point, you have the smaller system that we have is 25 gallon per minute system. Um, and that goes all the way up to very large flows uh, in, in excess right now of, of 1500 gallons. There are distinct model types. Some have oxygen production on side, some have, uh, you know, a variation in control systems. So that variability in cost is, is quite significant, but, but basically, I mean, the lowest end, it starts around $10,000. Um, Fernando asked, does the use of the machine depend on the volume of the tank? In other words, is the volume a limitation for the operation of the machine? Um, well, I mean, just expounding on what I just said, no, I mean, theoretically, you could you could operate a small system on as, as little as, as 30 gallons per minute, but um, particularly in relation to plants, we, we don't want to continue to run a pump um, on a small volume of water because we're going to heat that water and that's not a good thing either. Um, and then we want to be able to oxygenate it to that certain set point, but also in, in our case, we want to produce and, and introduce a, um, as many nanobubbles into the system as possible. And if the volume is too small, the equipment just can't run for long enough. Um, so you could, you know, you could auctionate any any volume, but again, commercial viability and then taking those other parameters into consideration um, is a is a a major a major thought process in that. Um, is there a limitation on nanobubble saturation to impact um, hydroponics vitamin solution? Depends. I mean, depends on if it's, uh, I mean, vitamins is a pretty broad question, right? Um, if we're talking about plant, plant nutrients, no. I mean, 
Uh, specifically, if you're looking at like um, uh, a question we get a lot about is, is you know, iron chelates, which is obviously like some of your most um, important or, or most costly input. Um, and the ORP levels, so the oxidation reduction potential are typically well below the threshold where that will be precipitated out. Um, an important distinction between an iron chelate versus um, iron that you may find in your well water, which, which can be a lot much more easily um, oxidized and precipitated out. Um, is there a possibility of oxidative stress on the roots? Similar question to the last one. Absolutely. Um, so it, it, it depends on the crop type. So. I mean, if we just look at leafy greens, for example, um, the biggest challenge crop for the industry is spinach. Um, there's not too many people that are growing that successfully. Spinach, as an example, um, has a much lower oxidation threshold, oxidation stress threshold. So you definitely don't want to be running um, too high of a dissolved oxygen level with that. Um, on the flip side, arugula loves oxygen. Um, could sustain a much higher level of oxygen. So that's why I was sort of in the presentation, I was defining that, that point where in some cases people want to be just at saturation. Um, in other crops, uh, particularly in warm water conditions, where there's a presence of disease, you can, you can go very high. So we have some customers that in summer are running 30 parts per million in the dissolved oxygen level in their tanks and um, there's no oxidation stress. But Again, um, the people that run into challenges are potentially sometimes where they're co-cropping and they have different varieties in the same water. Um, uh, just make sure that you know you're grouping those together with similar <clears throat> oxygen oxidation um, thresholds. <clears throat> um, is there an application for this technology on hog farm lagoons? which are currently being uh, treated anaerobically. Did I hear you say hog farm lagoons? Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, an unorthodox aquaponics question. Um, yes, I mean, I mean, the short answer is um, just the technology has applied. Again, I mean, if you just look at the fundamentals of it, like we're providing or supplying oxygen to support a biological or chemical process um, in the form of wastewater. You, you're again, you have those two parts. Either people are trying to oxidize um, the organic elements inside their water, or we're trying to support a biology in there that's biologically oxidizing that material. Both, no matter which way you go, both are dependent on oxygen or oxidation. Um, and we apply the technology um, in a number of wasteful applications. Um, so yeah. Do you have data on the um, how much dissolved oxygen different crops need, like by crop? Um, I would. I mean, we have our own reference points. Yes, I mean, based on um, you know the ones that 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 we most commonly deal with um, cannabis is, is extremely common uh, crop and um, you've got tomatoes, cucumbers and peppers and then those leafy green varieties. And, and yes, the short answer to the question is, is we have recommended rates based on um, our experience with in, in working with those crops. Is that something uh, you're able to share? Yeah, I mean, if somebody has a specific question, there is, there is a, again, one, a, 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 probably an opportunity I was going to mention later in the session here, but, but again, there's, there's quite a bit of um, academic uh, papers out there looking at oxygen as it relates to different crops. And um, we have a, a summarized list of that. And, and if anybody is interested to, to look through some of that, um, we can point them to those papers. And, and again, just feel free to email us um, and we'll be happy to provide that reference list. Um, someone asked, uh, Andrew McGee asked, 
to, for you to do like a quick back of the envelope calculation. Um, they have a DWC system with 45,000 gallons. Um, their main crop is lettuce and they just try to grow, have enough fish to be able to feed their lettuce in a balanced manner. Um, what sort of equipment costs and monthly operating costs might they be looking at? Where, and sorry, um, I don't think you mentioned where and whereabouts is this? I don't know. Uh, yeah, Andrew didn't say. I don't know, Andrew, if you want to type in real quick where you are. No. Yeah. Uh, so, I yeah, I mean, back of the envelope, for us, it would be um, a, probably a 50 GPM system for as it relates to our technology. Um, the OPEX is, is relevant to, unfortunately, a, a a few parameters and, and that's all taken into consideration. So for example, do they cool the water? What, you know, what is the, what part of the country are they in? So guys that, that experience um, you know, much hotter uh, climates may, may determine that they want to run their um, dissolved oxygen levels at five ppm more than, than somebody in Canada, for example, where it's, it's a lot more moderate. So that, that 5 ppm shift in dissolved oxygen levels may be, you know, a, a different, not maybe, it will be a difference in an OPEX cost. And the other big determining factor is, um, in terms of OPEX, is whether we're producing oxygen or we're using, um, you know, bottled or, or bulk oxygen. So um, that range, I mean, honestly, it's probably if the back of the envelope is, I want to say uh, maybe 50 bucks a week, 50, 60 dollars a week in terms of auction if you're buying oxygen. And there's some variability there depending on where you're located. Is it um, some guys pay 30 dollars a bottle for a bottle of auction, some are paying a little bit more. So there's some logistical costs that goes into consideration. So hard to be specific without um, diving into those details. Um, are your machines multifaceted so that they would be able to deliver different levels to the fish side and the plant side? Um, technically, yeah. I mean, anything's a, a achievable with with a certain degree of automation. I mean, um, you could theoretically have a system that that through valves treats one side versus the other. You could have independent dissolved oxygen sensors in both sides, which is fed to our PLC, and then the PL you're setting the PLC based on a certain set point. So, when one you, you basically open open the valves to the plant side, recirculate that water to a certain threshold set point. Uh, those valves close. You switch over to the fish. Again, you could be running in a batch and just alternating between the two, and then you're having individual uh, measurements for both sides. So our friend Patricia Milner from the USDA joined us. Hi, Pat. And she asked, do you have data on oxygen reduction potential low and high limit values to use on a per gallon basis to meet fish and plant needs, but that don't reduce beneficial bacteria? Yeah, sure. I mean, generally, again, it, it depends on what the target organism is. I mean, we, we're typically, if you're just running oxygen, we're never more than 400 um, ORP in the, in the system in most cases. Um, but you're probably balancing anywhere between two and 400. Um, anything above there, uh, particularly getting into the 450 range, you may be precipitating um, your chelates out, which we, we want to avoid. Um, and, and it's an important distinction. Um, again, I, you know, I, I touched on this a little bit in the presentation, but it, but I know there's a lot of erroneous information out there um, as it relates to nanobubbles. And, and specifically, when we're managing diseases, we're, the primary mode of action is that, that we're doing this through competitive exclusion. And that means promoting beneficial bacteria um, which ultimately is out competing pathogenic bacteria. There, there is the possibility where the nanobubble, as I was saying in the presentation, where when it does collapse, 
it can produce its own hydroxyl radicals, which, which may um, inactivate certain types of pathogens. We're generally controlling for that. So there's a way that we can intentionally cause that collapse through some catalyst that we, we may adopt. Um, but in general, um, when it's in an aquaponics, hydroponic system, what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance that ecosystem rather than creating sort of a, a heavy oxidation process that um, is basically eliminating all the beneficial stuff. We, we try and look at the role of oxygen as a, not only a lower cost alternative to things like sanitizers and peroxide and, 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 um, and ozone, but we look at it as more of a synergistic um, component to potentiating the beneficial organisms, uh, particularly guys that are using um, uh, beneficial growth for nutrient conversion. Um, and then, you know, as far as root, de, root, root health, those other sort of organisms that may play a role in disease suppression and, and enzyme production and, and stuff like that. Um, promoting it through an auction rich environment for us, we feel like that's a, a not only a, a safer uh, tool, but a, a, a more a better value in return um, as an input for um, a system. Um, does this technology affect the water temperature? No, not unless not unless it's again. I was mentioning earlier about the pump. So, to the extent that you're not over pumping, like recirculating a small amount of water continuously. Um, under normal conditions, no, there's, there's, there's little variation, in pump, but it is proportionate to the volume that we're treating. Have you used ozone on returning from the plants and going back to the fish, water to accelerate, accelerate the reaction of ammonia to nitrate? We haven't specifically done it for that purpose. We've, we've certainly injected ozone um, generally as an oxidant to, to uh, could be BOD, COD reduction, or just as a sanitizer, we can do it. But I, we, we haven't specifically looked at it as it promotes, for promoting um, uh, ammonia oxidation. Any other questions? Uh, Warren, do you want to add anything before we sign off? No, I think that was a good a good um, a spectrum of, of questions. Again, like if if anybody thinks of anything else, or you would like us to specifically look at one of your projects to sort of give you a, a much better and specific recommendation about the equipment, and we can also get into sort of operational cost um, if that's a big thing. And then again, just to sort of repeat, um, anybody that's interested in in you know looking at some some more specific literature papers that are out there that have been you know everything i should reiterate uh everything that we generally talk about we're quite um diligent about either it's it's first-hand experience that we have through our own references again it's um in general we have well over a thousand installations in, in all parts of the world and um Specifically in horticulture, it's a smaller, but it's it's a very healthy spectrum of all types of cultivation systems. Um, it's either through that direct experience, university research that we've done ourselves in different capacities, and then there's a, a whole variety. Each each month, you know, there's new new literature coming out that supports either like the biofilm removal or the the biofiltration potentiation, like the wastewater parts, and then um horticulture agriculture as it relates to different different plant types so please don't hesitate to reach out to to us and we'll be happy to help great well before we sign off just remember that the uh together with aquaponics conference is coming up uh virtually october 22nd to 24th uh if you're interested head to aquaponicsconference.org uh, thank you, Warren, for a great webinar. It was very interesting and I think very valuable for the aquaponics community. Uh, and we'll keep in thank touch. Uh, we'll be sending you a recording. This recording will be available um, in a few days to association members in our members area. And with that, thank you, everybody, and have a good day. Thanks, everybody.